thank you very much for joining us. We're really excited to have everyone here. This is part of a series of webinars that the Nature of Cities is having around uh, collaboration, co-creation in cities, uh, and the arts. In particular, one of the things that we uh, are doing uh, during this COVID period is uh, as part of our engagement with, with, uh, with arts and other urban practices, we are creating virtual galleries of shows that were canceled because of COVID, that were set up, work we, that we would like to see but could not because of COVID. We started this process about a month ago with the show, Patrick Lydon show in Osaka. Now we are continuing it with a show we opened a couple of days ago by um, Katrine Klassens, who is here with us today, along with Nina Marie Lister uh, from Toronto. They're joining us from Montreal and, uh, and um, in Toronto. Uh, the show uh, was originally scheduled for 99 Loop Gallery in Cape Town. Katrine is, is Cape Tonian herself. Um, and the, we lost the show there, but we can see it online now at The Nature of Cities. So we encourage you to go see it. Um, and we are supporting these shows through voluntary contributions. So we hope you can leave a little bit in the tip jar, but please go see the show and go uh, and tell us what you think and come back to this webinar in the future as well. The, the point of these ideas is to put, these webinars is to put different points of view together in the same room, talking about some core idea. And that core idea today is Katrine's beautiful, beautiful, paintings. So uh, let's start, Katrine and uh, Nina Marie, if you would give us a, uh, give us a little bit about um, yourselves. Um, Katrine, how about you go first? Who are you? Sure. <laughs> I'm Katrine. And I just want to start off by saying thank you to David. You have an incredible capacity for bringing people from different disciplines together and helping them have conversations, which is quite, <laughs> sadly, quite a rare thing. So my background is fine art. I was a full-time painter for about 10 years, but there was always something you know, environmental to my work. And as the climate crisis became more apparent, I decided to go and actually do my master's in climate change. Since then, I've been working at the intersection of art, communications, um, policy, climate change, and yeah, this is what I'm about. So. I suppose that would be my background. Thank you. Nina Marie, uh, you're a longtime Nature of Cities uh, contributor. Tell us about yourself. I, at the risk of um, you know, pushing the Nature of Cities over the edge, David, I'm your number one fan, I think. <laughs> the Nature of Cities <laughs> Thank you. is a family to me. I'm so honored and privileged to be here today talking to this wonderful woman who's with you who has um, shared with us just this incredible insight into the world. And I'm just delighted. Um, it's also a real treat for me because in my day job, I am uh, also privileged to be working with students all the time. I'm the graduate program director of the School of Urban and Regional Planning at Ryerson University in Toronto. But my background came first as a field ecologist. I worked in for Parks Canada, I worked in for the province of Ontario, I worked as a, an ecologist and I specialized in wetland areas and areas outside the city. And eventually I went back to school multiple times and ended up as an academic. But I like to say really I'm a pracademic because I work in planning, landscape planning in particular, which means everything I do is applied in some way. And when I come from the world of science and social science, it's a real transition to work in such a beautiful and creative medium. And I've discovered I really love it. Um, maybe that's also because I work in an area of design and I work with a lot of landscape architects. And it's been really insightful for me to see the world of design as a, a trajectory and, and an opening uh, to apply some, of, some creative thinking to the research about the natural world. And frankly, this exhibit has offered me an opportunity to speak in a more personal voice. And Katrine, I would say, has been a mentor to me in that respect. She's really helped me to to find that voice and maybe um, give it permission uh, a little bit. Um, so it feels like a, a learning experience for me and, and I'm very privileged to be here talking about it. Yeah, Thank David, you. and another thing I suppose would be to note is that Nina Marie and I have been having these conversations for about three years. And it's been an interesting kind of a library that we have now on WhatsApp of voice notes, pictures of nature and cities that have 
inspire the works indirectly and directly. And, and if you go and check on, on uh, the Nature of Cities websites, you'll see Nina Marie's uh, essay, along with images that we have exchanged. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's a real thrill to have you both here. The, the, uh, those of you listening, I do encourage you to go to thenatureofcities.com and see the, the, the pictures that Katrine has uh, painted in this, on this topic. And uh, Nina Marie has written a companion essay, a meditation, if you will. We're going to see a couple of the pictures in a few minutes as we start talking. Um, Katrine and, and Nina Marie are, are two of about 800 contributors at Nature of Cities from around the world and all different points of view. And so this is, these are the kinds of conversations we crave putting together. So, in this particular one, this particular collaboration between the two of you, the, the paintings and the meditation by Nina Marie, I, I understand that, there, that there's a thread there of two parakeets separated by a hundred years and the idea of what, what we value about a, maybe a dead extinct par parakeet and one that's an invasive parakeet in cities around the world. What's the, what's the thread of those two parakeets that, that brought you two together in this way? Right, David, I'm just going to share my screen to show exactly what we're talking about. So can everyone, can you see it? Yes. Yes, we can. Right. Okay. <laughs> On the left, we have a picture of um, an urban parakeet in, in Paris. In the center, I mean, <laughs> an urban, a rose ring parakeet. In the center, there's a detail of one of those birds. And on the right is a painting of an extinct South Carolina parakeet. And this really is a central uh, motif theme and kind of answers all the questions, um, well, not answers all the questions, but is, is essential to this exhibition. I feel like the crux of what we're talking about is actually here. Um, there's two moments here that inspired these paintings. The first was um, finding out about the South Carolina parakeet, which was the only uh, parrot native to um, Eastern America. And it was shot out of existence. People shot it for their feathers and people shot it because mostly because it was a pet. Lost a lot of habitat. And in, I think it was 1918 or 1917, it went extinct. There were a few sightings after that in a marsh or two, but those could have just been escaped pets. We don't actually know. And another moment that I had was, um, a few years ago when I was at COP21, which is the Conference of the Parties, the UN's uh, yearly climate change meeting. And it was a super intense time. Um, it was quite depressing, even though we did get to a good agreement in that. It was um, climate, climate change is hard and it's hard to feel uh, hopeful all the time. And I was in a city park in the middle of winter and a flock of these bright green birds squawking um, landed in a tree. And it was a powerful moment for me because it offered firstly a moment of beauty, but also in the weight of, of all those negotiations, it offered me something about hope as well. Funny thing is, Nina Marie had not heard my story about the parakeets in Paris and actually had written her essay about her experience with parakeets in Paris. So that photo on the left there actually comes from her. I don't know if you want to jump in there about your experience of the parakeets in Paris. Yeah, sure. Um, so much of this collaboration has come about by coincidence and um, collision, I would say. With colliding experiences, and they're also contradictory experiences of what is lost and what is found, of what is disappearing and what is showing up, emerging in strange and unusual places. So the dislocation, you might say, of the parakeets from their home ranges into places where we never expected them is a, a puzzling and interesting phenomenon. It also ties into a lot of my own work in contemplating what novel and emerging ecosystems are and what role they have in a world that is changing profoundly where we mourn species leaving us and yet perhaps don't see those that are relocating, sometimes hidden in plain sight, others yeah. other times walking into our vision. Um, and I what's happen also so interesting is how similar they look. They're uncannily yeah. similar. The one has gone and shot out as a pest and now we have this story of resilience with this parakeet that a lot of cities it's become naturalized in Europe. Europe it's got feral white 
uh, wild populations. I think there's about 50,000 or something like that in London. Cities yeah. hate them and yet they're thriving and we've lost this other bird. So part of this also for me was this question of what have you, how do we learn from the past to stop that happening again? How do we not only love what is wild and, and extinct, but what nature we have with us now, even if it's not indigenous? Well, yes. What do we make of the nature now? What do, what do we make of it? And, and how do we understand our role in it is another key question for me that underlies a lot of my own research when it comes to applying in terms of city park design or the spatialization of dealing with urban biodiversity. I mean, we, I could easily have also written about um, you know, Mexican parakeets that are relocated to Los Angeles and in their own home ranges, they're actually excavated. They're lost from their home and yet rediscovering, resettling human settlements uh, far north that are also changing. So these are some very pressing questions for us and they're also deeply uh, both psychological and philosophical questions of how we relate to a new urban nature while mourning the nature that we are losing because of our ideas about what normal behavior is. And the fact that one can point to another, you know, most of the world's population is urban now. We, we hit that milestone, I think about five, five years ago. And when I was doing my degree in climate change, I mean, there were days when <laughs> I know I wasn't the only one, some of my uh, fellow uh, candid uh, master's candidates are here as well today. I would just get hit by a paper and I would just weep at my desk. And I think it's important to talk about how sad that can be. But at the, on the same hand, one thing that made me feel excited and hopeful, very hopeful and very excited was cities and what we can do with them in the future, how we can make them greener, wilder, more, more beautiful, more just, more accessible. And um, that was something that profoundly has changed how I've related to nature in cities and, and my work as well. Yeah, Katrina, I really appreciate that, that viewpoint. I know there are lots more questions to carry on, but I think that I'm, I want to lay some of these threads down that um, will come to the birds, I think, more in conversation. But this idea that we don't respect species that are adaptable to humans is a very interesting and prevalent theme um, that we see around us in, 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 urban, in urban areas in particular. So the city, the, the animals that are most acclimatized to human habitats, we tend to value the least, the blue jays, the raccoons, the squirrels, the parakeets, as it turns out. And yet in their wild places, they're precious, they're ephemeral, they're incredible to see. So what is, we, we eat? What, what, what is it, right, that we make of this? I think we'll come back to that theme a little more in the conversation. Let me interject and say that um, the, for, for everyone listening, there, there's an opportunity to ask questions. You can raise your hand, I believe, but you can also use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to pitch questions um, either in text form or we can, we can uh, unmute your microphone and you can ask them. You can ask uh, Katrine and Nina Marie questions live. I want to return to the question of value. Uh, you both touched on the idea of how do we value things. We value them by giving them a place in our lives. Um, we value them by seeing them all the time, but maybe sometimes we, we, un, we diminish their value if we see them all the time. Say a pigeon, for example. How, how can we as, as urbanists, as people who live in cities, who want to see, who desire to see more nature in cities, how do we create the idea, how do we create a conversation around the value of of wild things in city, cities, I think plants, we'll quote, birds, perhaps, animals. Yeah, that Nina Marie um, told me, and I, I would just like to start off this part of the conversation with that. It said, um, to have an ecological education is to live in a world of wounds. So, <laughs> a challenge for environmentalists and people that actually know what, what they're seeing when they look in a landscape, that something that lo looks pristine is actually far away from perhaps its baseline, that is actually polluted, that is vastly more poor in biodiversity than it was before, is a challenge for people that actually work, you know, in these spaces. Um, Neymar, you want to come in on that? Well, I, I feel like this is a, a such a critical question when we sit here on the edge of the Anthropocene with more than eight 
or almost 8 billion people living in urbanized areas, most of which, by the way, around the world are on a collision course with the world's richest biodiversity hotspots. I know I, I, in my essay, I talk a little bit about that and relate to Richard Weller's lovely atlas for the end of the world in which he's mapped some of these collision hotspots. And it reminds us with stark clarity that the quality of the wild is seemingly out of reach in these hotspot collisions. And yet it's not. There, there is the opportunity and there ought to be, frankly, a human right to experience the wild. If for no other reason, then it cultivates the wild and the human. That we have this profound relationship with nature as ephemeral and, wil and, and wilderness as essential and vital. And we don't see it as a possibility in our cities. And yet it is all around us. The wildlife that exists in our cities, particularly when we cultivate a sensibility, a respect for a legibility of biodiversity is, is essential. Um, these are the landscapes, perhaps the only landscapes, urban landscapes are the ones our children will ever know in the future. That's, that's a shocking thing to contemplate. And if that's the case, we need to be asking very hard questions, profound questions that are beyond science and into the realm of values. How do we value the wild in the city? And sometimes it's the mongrel and the mundane. Uh, other times it is the common species that's right in front of us, or it's that flash of emerald green of a bird we've never seen before. And these are, I think, are, are really critical messages that appear um, in Katrine's paintings. The, the contradiction and the conflict of the wild and the tame, the mundane, the mongrel, and, and the ephemeral are all themes that Katrina's painted and about. And I think they are the questions of the moment. How will our children value these urban landscapes, the only ones they may ever know? How do we make them legible and gonna, relatable? I'm gonna bring up a picture here of a kind of, um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Bringing up a picture here of um, a kind of example of the <laughs> moments of nature and urban landscape that we can begin to value. There was, um, with Pippin Anderson, who teaches urban ecology at the University of Cape Town in the Environment and Geographic Science Department, we went on a field trip to a small nature reserve in Cape Town. And one of the guides there, it was, it's a very watery, it's the Edith Stevens Natural um, Reserve there. And it's surrounded by an informal settlement and the park actually has one of the lowest crime rates of any national park in South Africa. And what the, the guide said is that sometimes, you know, we need landscapes that look like what's inside us. So I personally don't relate to a manicured park with a neat lawn, neat trees, and a bunch of planted flowers that are ripped out every summer and then planted back again in the spring. I don't feel a lot of connection with that. I see it as a kind of a space of, um, I mean, I'm glad that it's there, but I see it as a place of, of ecocide. So when we're looking at places like parking lots, um, railway verges, just cracks that come up on the dandelions that push up through the cracks um, in the screens, these places are often seen as being unsafe or, um, or perceived as being unsafe or um, ugly or things that need to be neatened up and pulled out. There are often complaints when lawns aren't mowed. And, but for me, when I look at these places, I feel like it reflects something more of what's inside me. It's a nature where it's okay for me to go pick the flowers and look at the bugs and lie down. It's a place where it's okay to make a fire in some places. We have a place here in Montreal called Champs de Possible and it's, it's neglected, but it's not unlovely. No, or to forage. Do you think of, right? That's another piece of, of, of this, mm -hmm. sorry, David. This is, this is another theme I, I would say in Katrine's work of access um, and equity, that we all have a right to the urban landscape, to urban nature. I, I'd argue it's a human right and they ought to be accessible. They ought not to be sterile um, and so precious that we can't enter them or that we can't feed ourselves from them. So there is a theme too of foraging in your work, Katrine, mm -hmm. in wild places where if they're not cultivated, there's the opportunity for foraging, to realize that, that nature provides, that there and is bounty 
And it's connected. It's not a national park where you can't do certain things. It's not a normal park where you can't touch stuff. I feel places like this very connecting. Uh, let's see some more of your work, uh, Katrine. And and as we see it, well, tell us a little bit more. Uh, tell tell us a little bit more about the idea that uh, you are memorializing somehow or, or or valorizing the idea of the wild in cities. All right, I'm going to pick up, bring up another image for this. <clears throat> So here we have two photographs. The one of, <laughs> on the left is a painting of mine. On the right is a camera trap of a deer um, caught in a, in a garden um, in, I think it is somewhere in Vermont. Um, I, when, I, when I started painting, I started painting or I started painting photographs of childhood and uh, family. And part of that was this sensation of the world changing, of myself changing at, probably at that point, and wanting to hold onto it tightly, feeling like something was being lost. I think I grew out of <laughs> that a little bit more about the, the, per, the personal loss, but that became, um, as my education of, about the environment and climate change grew, something about something larger about losing something in the larger world, about wanting to grip onto the time we have now. As diminished as nature is right now, there is something that I want to preserve that I feel we're, we're losing. And you'll uh, notice these, that, yeah, go on. Sorry, Katrine. I just uh, wanted to comment. These images really capture uh, what is hidden in plain sight. The wildlife are there. We don't necessarily see them. They participate in nature at different times and in different lights than we can appreciate. And your images capture that ephemerality and bring it into a really stark relief to show these beautiful creatures passing in the night or caught only by an observant lens, not a person. And the, the paintings, I think, give off this sense of flattened resonance. Yeah, and there's something, we, we, you and I spoke a bit about the flash, and there's an image I'll bring up later, um, which goes more into the camera flash. I, you know, you talk about, there's certain things that are losing resolution and definition. These are animals that often, sometimes they're in plain sight, and sometimes they're just skirting the edges of our periphery periphery. You know, we trespass on their spaces and there's this trespass that's not equal, <laughs> but it comes into ours. And, and that thing, I think that point you made, I think something like, I don't know, almost every major city in the world is near a biodiversity, biodiversity hotspot. And there's a reason for that. We need these places and they provide a lot of income and um, for people. So with this camera flash that we spoke about, it kind of reflects the idea of something that's so brilliant that could capture so many details in such an unflattering light, but sometimes it's so bright that you, you lose the definition of what's right up close. Yeah, there's one other piece to that, if I could add. What I found so fascinating, Katrine, in our collaboration, I didn't know you were painting these camera trap images and yet they are images that have been central to my own research for the last decade. They're not taken by me, but rather by other ecologists with whom I work, who, who are studying the way animals move across roadways and use camera traps to determine hotspots where vehicle wildlife collisions are likely to happen. And my lab work is to design infrastructure effectively to use those data to help us design infrastructure to move wildlife safely. And I'd never thought about these images as more than research data until I began to look at those that were flashed. When the old version of the cameras flash, or in other words, the motion sensor is triggered, um, I would, the animal, there'd be an audible click and the animal subject would turn to look at the camera and it provided a series of really haunting moments in looking at these research data, suddenly as individual 
creatures who were looking mm. at me. They were looking at the researcher, the camera caught their expressions, and sometimes um, they were really uh, evocative, wolves uh, playing with the cameras. I think there was just one yesterday um, that appeared, that was posted by the Nature Conservancy or by Yellowstone to Yukon perhaps, of a cougar playing with the camera. It had obviously clicked in the camera. The cougar was attracted to it, and so the video recording is the cougar playing with the camera. So exactly. the, you're, you're, yeah, and the large part of this is the, the quirks of this, that we can find a lot of moments of joy in our cities, of joy in nature, of um, delight. It's not all <laughs> doom and gloom. And when we get excited about these things, that tells us something about ourselves as well. So I brought up this image. Um, Nina Maria, are you still there? Anyway, uh, David, you can hear me. Okay, yes. I brought up this Go image. Ahead. On the left is a painting um, for this exhibition. It's based on a photograph of a, uh, I think it, he was just a postman or something, a Victorian photographer that photographed deer at the bottom of his garden. About, I think this, this photo, the photograph this painting was based on, um, uh, was photographed in about 1910 or something like that. And, and at that point, deer populations had dropped dramatically in the United States due to habitat loss or forest growth. And now their populations have increased so much that again, they're considered a pest. And they're, but it's not the same as it was before because a lot of these populations are very unhealthy. Um, they have problems with worms. There's not a lot of genetic diversity. So there's this interesting thing of well, we have what was gone before. It didn't actually go extinct, but we're left with something quite different. We have a question from, from um, uh, um, among our attendees that I'd like to, to read out to you because it, it, it touches on this idea of engagement and how do, we pr how do we create more engagement around the idea of urban nature? I'm just gonna read the question as, as it was typed in. Do you see the more polished, quote unquote, or refined state of greenery as an entryway to reconnecting with nature, a starting point for people who are used to a sterile, concrete urban spaces, who have been conditioned to fear nature and who find the wild, quote unquote, the wild and unkempt aspects of nature unsavory? Do you think perhaps there is a need for these spaces? these intermediate natural spaces to be a stepping stone toward the wilder, rewilded spaces that, that you all are talking about. Or perhaps even there's a way to find, to find an element of wild nature, even in our most commonplace interactions with nature in a city. How do you respond to, the, to this questioner? David, I think um, we're at a, a great time for that because I think urban ecologists and people working for cities are mindful at last <laughs> of uh, the fact that we do need flowers for pollinators. Uh, if you look at pesticide use in Europe and that's a place that influences a lot of policy um, for uh, urban design and planning uh, across the world, uh, they're reducing their pesticides, they're letting things grow. There's a book by an author called Emma Maris, and what she says is that we need to let this urban nature start snowballing upon itself, something that creates more as it grows, which, which I love. I think, um, yes, Nina? I'm nodding, the red oh, okay. garden. But I will say something, when you first ask your, ask your question, can these manicured spaces create um, an entry point? My first reaction was no, because <laughs> I personally don't relate to them. But um, I actually don't think that's true. And I'm just wondering, you know, just feeling out where that reaction um, came from. So, well, in fact, we need uh, cities. Yeah. Cities need diverse, a diverse set of spaces to serve everyone's needs in the city. Right? There's there. We can't. Exactly. There can't just be. We complain that that uh, that we would complain if there were only ball fields and manicured lawns. Yeah. Um, just like we would complain if there were only wild spaces, because lots of different people live in the city, and what we want is to, to create a diversity of experiences. That's that's exactly. the Jane Jacobs sidewalk idea applied to the idea of green space. Yes. 
And I mean, I, I'd add, if I may, that there's, as Katrina has said, there is already terrific progress. Uh, we're, look, we're coming out of a century of the tyranny of the lawn, uh, particularly here in North America as a settler colonial set of states. Uh, the, the lawn was given to us as a kind of colonial dream, and it's taken us a hundred years to get out of that mindset. And I say out of the mindset because it is precisely about, as Katrina, you've mentioned, a kind of sterility. It is about cleaning up nature and giving us a, a garden of organization that is not cacophonous and kaleidoscopic, but is in fact a sterile monoculture the croquet lawn, for example. And we know in landscape design that every good park deserves a great lawn for gathering, but beyond the edges of the lawn, there needs to be the wild. And we've made terrific progress, I think, in our cities of reintroducing more biodiverse ways of designing and planning our public green spaces. But where we haven't perhaps made progress is where David uh, suggests in equitable access, diversity of places for a diversity of people that are safe. And these are not ideas in opposition, they're presumptions of opposition. So we have a lot of work to do in the execution, but the ideas are definitely there. We have pollinator gardens and bioswales and green rooftops that are urban farms now, uh, but we're still stuck in some places in the tyranny of the lawn. I think there's also something, um, thinking back to your question, David, when I first arrived in Vancouver, I stayed in a hostel. And uh, there I met a, a, re a young refugee who had just arrived by herself. And we went out to explore the city. And I, <laughs> I just thought the, 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 the office parks around the city were just the most they had these little gardens planted around them and I was nauseous. I thought they were the most ugly, garish thing I'd ever seen. It was red flowers, green flowers, like purple flowers, like all together um, and like a fake little waterfall and this like maybe even a little bit of plastic grass and I was like, oh. And she was enchanted with these spaces. She wanted a photograph in front of every single one of them. And that made me think again about, you know, the fact that I might relate to this. I mean, on the screen over here, on the one side is a picture of a, a bush in a place um, near the University of Cape Town, which makes me feel very unsafe. And on the right is a, um, a rabbit in a vacant lot over here in Montreal. So I just want to speak a little bit to this painting on the left. Right next to the University of Cape Town, there used to be a zoo. In fact, when you're taking the turn off, you can see it now says UCT this way. But if you look at it in a certain light, it says Dierate, which means zoo in, in Afrikaans. So there's that other little remnant there. I used to walk past um, the old zoo, uh, which is completely abandoned right now, every single day on my way to work. And there was just this beautiful, beautiful fuchsia bush that you can see here. There was a road, a bunch of bushes, and um, a footpath. And I always used to look on the footpath and I, I love this bush because it was left, it had just gone completely wild, but it was left over from the gardens that were planted at the entrance of the zoo. <clears throat> there was a series of, of rapes in that area. And this place that I had found so enchanting, suddenly I was not walking on that footpath, I was rather walking on the road. And there is something different for women here, I think, than for men or for, you know, for anyone that's, that's um, vulnerable. And, you know, we're looking at these, these terrible stories of that incident in um, Central Park. I think it, it was two days ago. And thinking about how accessible these places are and for who as well. So this was nature that was taken away from me. And I think almost every other single woman. Um, and there was a sense of loss about that as well feeling profoundly unsafe. If this area had been manicured, if I'd had a clear line of view to see if there was anyone around, I would have felt much safer. But because it was overgrown and wild, it was not a safe place for me anymore. And probably never was. That's a transition to uh, another question we have. Uh, this one from, I think, uh, Martin Kohler in London. that relates to some of the things that you're talking about here. Uh, I'll just read the question to you. Uh, 
Living in London, I am struck that many urban environments around the world tend to be suburban in nature, unlike many traditional European cities. The dispersed nature of suburban cities aren't particularly sustainable. They threaten habitats as they expand. They require extensive car use. Yet suburban habitats also encourage diversity among flora and help support many ecosystems, bee, bees, for example. Would you care, either of you, to comment on this tension between sustainability versus support for nature? I actually had a full um, rich question. position devoted to this. Thanks for the question, Martin. Um, it was called Between the Blue Swimming Pools. And, and you can see it uh, on my website. And this was this, you know, we talk about climate change, the tyranny of the car. And a lot about that exhibition was these very uneasy spaces of suburbs, these private um, gardens and what they hold and what they could hold. Anyway, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit to more to the ecological role of um, suburbs in, in almost being green belts. You know, we look at them as just being all bad, but, you know, I, I come from a suburb. I, yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. And thank you for the question. It allows us, I think, to really understand nature as a gradient from the urban through to the wild. And the urban periphery is a big part of that. It also, I think, allows us to speak a little bit about the previous question as well, that, of course, we need uh, we need people to feel safe. We need people to have equitable access to the experiences of an urban nature and a suburban nature. We know there are very good data now, even though we may know it in our hearts and we know it anecdotally, but we know conclusively that an experience of urban nature is good for us, good for our mental health and well being, for our physical health and well being. And so therefore we need these experiences. And we can start with suburban lawns and pollinator gardens that are safe. We can start with, as the previous questioner asked about an entryway into a dialogue about maybe touching the wild. We see nature as a gradient that we make and remake from the urban core out and we protect parts of it that we don't go into. We I think cultivate a lot of it in our suburban cultures. And even that too is changing. We can, for example, as we do in parts of Ontario and Quebec and certainly in British Columbia and other parts of the country of Canada, um, we know that we have pollinator strategies in municipal, uh, municipalities well outside the city where people are encouraged on to garden with plants that are more diverse than what is only found at the, the local um, you know, hardware store perhaps and, and even our hardware stores are carrying more types of plants that are low and biodiverse. So I would never fall into the trap of vilifying the suburbs as anti-nature but rather it's a different kind of nature on a gradient and we need to ensure that there are all those experiences. So communication, education, legibility and, and I think this kind of collaboration where Katrina is able to use her paintings and as a gateway to conversation is really essential. And you look at a city, you know, you're talking about cities encouraging people. You look like at a city like Cape Town, where people had to plant indigenous plants, otherwise everything would die. I think back to my grandmother's garden that was planted um, full of hydrangeas, which need, you know, quite a bit of water. And I, I follow a gardening book, I think it's called Drought Gardening or something like that on, on Facebook about that was created during... Um, the lead up to what we thought was going to be day zero, the day where Cape Town ran out of water. And a lot of the comments there were uh, uh, from, because it's mostly women on that group, talking about how they'd lost plants that they'd had, had it down in their family for a hundred years. That European plants that were now untenable, their time had come, they were not you know, made for this new world. So there was that sense of loss, and then again, that what can we grow now? What, is, what, what can we... we do now? Let's change the subject just a little bit uh, and to, to pivot a little bit to the idea of collaboration and what we can learn across these uh, different ways of knowing. Um, so I, I know that you've been friends for a while, you've talked about the work, and, you, and yet you were also working in similar veins in parallel. You both were interested in some of the same ideas, and then you discovered that that parallel work. And so I'm curious, in this case, the, a, a, a dialogue across an art, science, and planning um, uh, 
boundary. I'm, I'm curious about how each of you might have been changed in your perspective. How, how was the idea, so as an artist, Katrine, how, how were you changed in your approach as a painter and the kind of things that you talked about and how you thought about those things or how you talk about the paintings? How were you changed by the idea of, of uh, having these deep conversations with Nina Marie? And likewise, as a, as a scientist and, and planner, Nina Marie, I'm curious about how you are changed by interacting with uh, an artist, a person who thinks uh, you both are creative people, but how, how, uh, how, do you, how do you think about your work differently when you talk about um, uh, your, when you would exchange ideas with a creative like Katrine? Let me also ask that we are, we are getting close to the end here. So I want to, if you have any other questions from the, from the group, please put them in the chat or raise your hand. So what about this idea of, of how we are changed by a collaboration? May I speak to that first? Please. Um, so my, uh, my master's degree was meant to be interdisciplinary and in many ways it was. But the first time I met Nina Marie was at this meeting that, that you had organized, David. And um, it brought together people from, oh man, a whole chocolate box of disciplines. And <laughs> I sat in that room as an artist and, and, you know, I would say that one of the reasons I, I did my master's in climate change was not only to understand, but to be able to speak with authority and to be able to contribute because I didn't think I could with only having an art degree. I didn't know what my contribution would be. My first response was to, um, to redo my final year of school to get, <laughs> to get better marks in maths and science because when I thought about who is contributing to solving the problem of climate change, I thought scientists. And what I experienced, um, I, I have experienced in many academic places is what I did experience was the idea that art should illustrate or somehow pander to science. David, this is something you and I have talked about. The art takes the, the, the lesser road because the science is so important. <laughs> I'm not saying the science is not important or necessary, but there's a lot more people that can contribute to this problem. This is, I almost feel like the scientists in, in terms of climate activism and, and action on climate change and action on the environment, I'm like, you guys kind of had a chance. And here we are 30 years later, <laughs> and we've got to bring more people into the circle. We've got to, that's the only way we can do this. And people feel afraid to speak. I feel afraid to speak and I have a degree in this. Um, so there's that. So that, that was the first thing is this kind of collaboration is so important that we truly listen and believe each other. And I've always felt that with, with Nina Marie, felt respected as an artist in these space because this is not always um, a place where art is valued or respected. I'd also just like to quickly talk about the image that I brought up here. On the, on the left is a painting of street flowers. I took a flash photo of um, the street bouquets that they hang up in um, across Canada, actually. And um, what I used to do is paint in white and then paint the layers of, of flowers over to give them color. But when I'd done white painting for this, I needed to leave it like that. There was something blank. There was something that was expressed with just the white that wouldn't have been expressed if I'd added the color. The second image is a scan of wildflowers that I gathered um, in the street and in vacant lots and building sites here in Montreal. And then the third is a cultivated flower, uh, a locally cultivated flower, uh, a photograph that Nina Marie actually took for me. So there's been this, again, with the rose ring parakeet, with the South Carolina parakeet, those very close visual, um, I'm not sure what the word would be, synthesis or communication or communion that's happened, which is also uncanny. And I think there's something there that we can't always necessarily see. And that's what art, art is about. What do you know versus what you think you know? Yeah. It's, Nina Marie, how about you? Thank you, um, Katrine. That's such a great entryway to allow me to, I think, once again, point to the, the value and the mission in some ways of the nature of cities which is to bring people together to discuss, to feel, to express, to talk about these complex challenges of nature in the city and the nature of the city. And this collaboration for me has unleashed all kinds of ways to think about 
my work differently, ways to learn to communicate my work with the help of others differently and learn to understand others' work. I know that for me, I, I felt very much as Katrine does, even trained in the natural sciences, which I did because I thought it would give me credibility and legibility um, as well as legitimacy. Um, it turns out actually that nobody much cares about the data. <laughs> <laughs> so how much further are we ahead on biodiversity conservation after a hundred years of naming cladistics and learning the names of species? <clears throat> As it turns out, we're falling further and further behind hourly. So surely there must be an important and urgent way to communicate that is better. And frankly, I think it's by reaching people's hearts. Um, they, they, it turns out that they really don't pay much attention to data at all. Not to say that that work is not important, of course, but that it needs a much broader, if I may say, canvas on which to be expressed. For example, I never would have taken the flash photograph of the parrot tulip that um, my neighbor cultivated. Oh my God, it's a parrot tulip. <laughs> parrot there tulip we go again. <laughs> cultivated by Flora Laura Flowers. Um, and it's simply gorgeous, but it, I thought it was gorgeous in natural light and I would never have photographed it with a flash except that I learned about why you are interested in this flattened quality that both distorts and highlights and particularly at night. It allowed me to see the flower very differently and it's such an interesting method of expression. I'd never done this before and I hadn't really paid attention to it. And what it taught me in a much broader way of thinking about it is that this collaboration is part of the trend, building a transformative capacity to talk about complex challenges, urgent problems of the city, and ways to communicate the value and legibility of nature. People will see these flowers differently. They will understand their gardens differently from the urban to the wild through these kinds of collaborations. And it's not to say that either method of communication is the right one, but rather like good music, we need the symphony of all the instruments and voices. And, and this really has helped me to find that expression in myself um, with, frankly, Katrine as a mentor. And by the way, um, when we did meet Katrine, I think that you, were, you had not seen dandelions seed before. And I think I blew one at you in, in your hair. Possibly I mussed your hair with it. I think that there was a flower theme there as well. <laughs> um, the, I, I, I very much resonate with the with the comments about the idea of of finding conversations among different types of people and you have to you have to have conversations just like you were talking with anybody you have to find conversations some that, that reach them somehow we can't keep telling the same story our own story over and over again if it's not actually communicating something to some someone else and in that sense we all have to learn to tell better stories across boundaries of difference it's, it's one of the core ideas of nature of cities we have another question from from the crowd that I'd like to uh, to read to you. This this one is from um, Andres Klassens. I hope I didn't mispronounce your name, Andres. Um, and I, are you related to Katrine? I don't know, but we'll find out in a second. Hi, Dad. Here's <laughs> ah, Dad. Okay, nice. Um, here's the question: How do you make provisions for the huge world of poverty around the edges of the majority of our cities in the world? The desperate poverty that clashes with the refined sensibilities and visions we have of a sustainable world that is necessary for the survival of our planet. What rewilding is happening in the city, in a city like Mumbai, for example? Ooh, yeah, what's really interesting about, you know, mentioning, I think it is, is it Mumbai? Uh, that's an interesting place where, uh, I I'm not sure which city in India it is, but there's a bunch of leopards that are coming in. I think they kill about 20 people a year. It's and um, their, their diet is like 40% dogs. <laughs> so what's interesting about them is that um, they actually perform an interesting ecosystem service. But of, of course, we can't have people um, taken off in the middle of the night uh, by, by wild animals in the city. And usually it's women and children that are affected by this. And, and the and poorer people. So the, the one thing you, we could also talk about here, David, is um, food security and the opportunities we have um, for growing food. I think that's a smaller part of the conversation, but I think when we're looking at natural solutions for climate change, at natural solutions for, um, uh, for 
like actually all kinds of other environmental change, nature can play a big role. And we've looked into, uh, for example, floodlands. We build a concrete channel and we channel the water through there. But guess what? There's now too much water due to unseasonal flooding. And the, these concrete channels aren't working anymore. What works better is a marsh. When we're looking at decreasing the urban heat island effect, which is where cities hold in and release more heat, planting trees um, and, and growing even just street gardens can reduce the temperature. Here they did a study in Montreal around two to three degrees. So the poorer, the poorer are going to experience the worst temperatures, the worst flooding, and there are very powerful natural solutions. And our instinct is to look at um, engineering for these things, but it actually needs to be ecological engineering and design as well. Nina Marie, I, you know more about this than me. <clears throat> So I think just, Katrine, really what we're emphasizing is that, again, the solutions are in front of us and they are not uh, hard engineering solutions alone. And for the poorest areas in the world, they're often already in place uh, at the margins of the city or in places where communities have taken back their streets to green them. For, to shade them or to plant food. The food security piece is enormous. I think until we are able to make a powerful connection more clearly between biodiversity and food security, we don't have a lot of hope for the protection of large landscapes of nature. And yet in the cities, that's where it may start. It may start in the gardens, the pocket gardens, the wild, the mongrel places where foraging still is permitted, and I mean facilitated by nature itself, not permitted by, by legal mechanisms, but rather that there exist at the perimeters, in the cracks, these opportunities to feed ourselves. We're doing it on rooftops in more expensive places, but we're doing it informally. I mean, if you think about even New York City's High Line, it was the, a place of urban gardening, um, you know, under the radar, so to speak, long before it was the world's Gorilla most expensive gardening. city park. Yeah, and I think that these are these are not um, municipal solutions; they're people's solutions, and they they have to be part of the dialogue. The, and with COVID nineteen, we're also seeing this. I, I know the city of Montreal has made some provisions to dig up part of its uh, botanical gardens. I, I think to grow vegetable patches. It can be a huge source of resilience, but also um, hope. You know, how do we use these these natural solutions? Bring our food closer to each other to not just create wealth, but security. Uh, just a, a quick interjection about the idea of Mumbai. If the, the Andres uh, asked a question about what's going on in Mumbai. It actually relates to, uh, a little bit to the question before about the stepping stone. Um, there, like many global South cities, um, Mumbai is very, very dense, and there's a number of projects in Mumbai that are trying to reclaim some linear parks, uh, riverways through Mumbai as ways to do two things, green and blue. Otherwise, uh, questions of uh, spaces that have become just places of waste and, and pollution to provide more access to more people because they are linear. They cut these, these streams cut through different neighborhoods of Hard Mumbai. And, and, they're, and, and so provide more of the benefits that we talk about in terms of nature to more people. I'd like to ask the, 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 um, Katrine and Nina Marie one last question before we were close. Um, and I think we also have another question from the, from the, from the crowd as well. I, I wanna ask, think a little bit about where you go from here. You've, uh, you, Katrine, obviously you continue to paint. Uh, Nina Marie, you continue to do research and, and plan and, and engage. Do you plan to continue your work together or or in in the idea in the context of how you have been changed by it, where where do you both go next in terms of these ideas i can't see us not working together so i think uh, we're gonna <laughs> be going ahead with that it's a very natural conversation and i and this actually makes me think that we need to do this this even more mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah that could be Absolutely. David, you've set the stage for us by bringing us together. And in fact, when we first met through the nature of cities, it was very much to talk about transdisciplinary ways of knowing and ways of communicating. So when I think about all of the photographs and the artworks that were not included in this exhibit, and Katrina and I discovered these amazing parallel um, works for both of us, we saw that there was a lot more work to be assembled and to be communicated. For me, very much of this is about making these ideas of urban nature accessible, relatable, legible, 
because once you have an understanding and a common language, as my friend Jane Wolf often says, it builds, it builds a shared understanding for values. You can make your values clear when you understand how something works. And so that's what we, we do. We do that together. And I think we do it at the Nature Cities. So I'm looking forward to whatever form they'll take. Great. Uh, we have one last question uh, from, from the crowd. It, the, uh, we're going to launch a quick poll as well. If you'd like to hear from us again about uh, our future uh, future work that we're going to do. Um, I'm going to ask you to keep your responses very short to this question. For this to this question, uh, there is a question from uh, Sarah Chang. It is uh, a, about values and justice. How do we shift perspectives to protect uh, per, uh, to protect productive soils for food rather than for wine or ex for exclusive high-end residential areas? Very briefly, what do you? How do you respond? Oh, Nina Marie, that is definitely your question. <laughs> We build our soils by providing a, a variety of plants to eat and to beautify our, our neighborhoods. We plant, we plant them, we keep them planted, we stop tilling them all the time, we build them up and we eat from them. Yeah. Yeah. Just to mention, Sarah Chang is a, a, a envir not environmental, she's a landscape architect working across the world on a lot of things like this. So great question, Sarah. So I want to thank everybody for for coming. Uh, especially, I want to thank Katrine Klassens and, and Nina Marie Lister for joining us and have sharing their ideas with us. Uh, please do go see the both Katrine's show and Nina Marie's meditation about the show. We will be uh, releasing. We will be doing more shows like this uh, in the coming uh, the coming months with a variety of of artists in collaborative contexts. Uh, and we will continue to have this webinar series around. Uh, uh, around ideas of collaboration and cross-disciplinary dialogue. Uh, I also want to say thank you very much to uh, the, the gallery that was originally going to, uh, to show Katrine's work in Cape Town. Uh, that yeah. is 90, yeah. the 99 Loop Gallery uh, in, in Cape Town. They, uh, they exhibit an immense amount of very beautiful work from, I believe, uh, all African uh, artists. It's a, it's a very uh, dramatic gallery, wonderful. And, and we try to, to make partnerships with galleries around the world for this, the presentation of these works. Um, so I, I wanna thank everybody for coming. Unfortunately, we've run out of time um, and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Many thanks, Katrine. Many thanks, thank Nina Lister. And uh, one last uh, thank you to the, to the Freak Arts team at Nature of Cities. Freak is the Forum for Radical Imagination on Environmental Cultures. Uh, and that's curated by Patrick Leiden and uh, Carmen Bouillet.